I'm, well, I'm not like telling any joke. I'm not telling any jokes over again. Um, so yeah, so I, I um, I'm going to talk about the ways that color um, appears in different lattice models and, and hopefully rectify my confusion. Um, I heard a Haitian proverb this weekend from my wife uh, that I think nicely summarizes my attitude toward mathematics. It's called "Deye mon gen mon," which means "Beyond mountains, there are mountains." Uh, I think that's uh, a, a good philosophy uh, for this for this seminar. You can take that as a positive or negative, depending on how you're feeling today. So. The, the idea here is that um, color, very simply, is just uh, a way to enumerate basis elements in a quantum group module. So you can recall that there's a, a pictorial incarnation of this through lattice models. So every Boltzmann weight in a lattice model vertex so maybe your vertex looks like you know this and you've got some labels on your edges a b c d then every boltzmann weight in the lattice model vertex is encoding uh, a matrix coefficient. In endomorphisms of V tensor W, where V has a basis uh, with one set of edge edge labels, let's say horizontal edge labels, and W has a basis indexed by vertical edge labels. I know we all sort of come to lattice models from different points of view. So I just thought I'd start by stressing this over and over again. So the way to think of this is that, that um, we've got these edge labels A, B, and they index some basis element in V tensor W. And the weight of the, the vertex is the matrix coefficient that you know sends it's the coefficient of um, CD that AB is sent to in this endomorphism. Okay, so I'm thinking of this as sort of my input basis vectors, and then I get some linear combination of outputs, and I look at the coefficient of the output of CD. That's my matrix coefficient in the endomorphisms of V tensor W. So in very simple cases, like for example, when um, the dimensions of V and W are both two, we can use all the kind of familiar decorations of these uncolored lattice models, arrows and spins, what have you, in order to decorate these two possible basis vectors. In the, in the very simplest case, right, if V and W are both the evaluation module for uh, UQ SL2 hat, uh, then uh, we get this familiar uh, six vertex model. Okay, but of course, there's nothing stopping us from considering higher dimensional representations or higher rank groups. And when we do that, then we enlarge the set of possibilities. So that's that's where I first uh, met color uh, in this language is um, back in this. A uh, classical result of Borodin and Wheeler from 2018. Uh, we speak of classical results when they're older than two years uh, in lattice model theory now. So this classical result says, uh, let's use color uh, to index uh, the standard module or the evaluation modules uh, of uh, UQ, SLR plus one hat. Or you could go further and you could use a, a fusion process uh, 
So what that fusion process does is it takes some uh, tensor product of modules. So you think of these modules in the columns as giving you some tensor product of modules and you smash them together and specialize the variables in just the right way so that you can project down to some interesting irreducible submodule in the multiple tensors uh, of this vector space. So in, in this case, um, they're, they're projecting to various um, symmetric powers of V, the standard module for UQSLN plus one. So the, it's a little bit small maybe on my, my iPad here, but if I zoom in a bit, you can see that um, here we're, we've got our colors, which are given by uh, letters like I and J. Here I and J are, are varying from one to R. Uh, and then uh, the, the associated weights for them. If I zoom back out again, now you can see the, um, in, in the fusion, they take on these much more complicated forms. This is the result of some natural process where I'm taking a bunch of weights stacked in a set of columns and I'm squeezing them all together and specializing the spectral parameter in a particular arithmetic progression so that I project to the symmetric power of this module. Okay, and, and you may notice like there's this funny S that shows up. Where did that new parameter come from? We were just in quantum groups before, but if you, if you smash these together, you get these integer powers of, of uh, parameters, and then you can do analytic continuation in those integer exponents and get these continuous parameters showing up in the weights. So, so that's what, um, what Borodin and Wheeler did with color. They explored these models, derived solvable lattice models from them. And you know, maybe the three takeaways uh, that I, I get from their paper is that uh, we, can, we can choose different boundary conditions that give rise to symmetric functions uh, and their non-symmetric analogs. Uh, so in this case, they get these kind of um, generalized uh, Hall-Littlewood uh, functions, Hall-Littlewood polynomials, and their non-symmetric analogs uh, in this particular case. And beyond that, the, the, the coloring uh, gives this nice interpretation of states in terms of colored paths, that, that might be useful whether you're studying probabilistic or combinatorial applications. And we'll see more examples of that in just a moment. And, and then there's, there's sort of additional flexibility here uh, in the weights. So the, the BW weights are stochastic weights. They're weights that are good for probability um, because you know, the sum of the Boltzmann weights in particular rows are equal to one, for example, or the R matrix exactly squares to one. And so there's some added flexibility to be able to, to choose weights uh, within a given module. The two processes I want to sort of highlight in changing the possible weights associated to a given module are uh, Drinfeld twisting and uh, changes of variables. And maybe the effect of Drinfeld twisting and the way it sort of affects the polynomials that we see is a sort of underappreciated part of this, uh, this field a little bit that um, a different Drinfeld twist can result in, in a much different polynomial. And that's maybe the, one of the morals we'll come to in the next uh, 10 minutes or so, uh, com coming to a totally different um, output from a similar original uh, initial quantum module. Okay, so far so good. Okay, so that, that's what I learned from, from Borodin Wheeler. Um, 
and then um, you know together with uh, Valentin and Dan and Henrik, that'll just be this uh, if I need it uh, from now on. Uh, we were using uh, color. We realized we could use color in uh, U, Q, S, L, R, 1, uh, standard module or evaluation modules V. And so in our picture, remember we had these edge weights. And so, you know, here we're using V uh, in the horizontal aspect, but it's actually still a mystery to us uh, what the module is uh, in the vertical direction. And, um, you know, we know it's, it should be some, some module for the quantum group that is the, the quantum Lie superalgebra. So there, there's some guesses, you know, that this should be something associated with the exterior algebra of W for some, uh, some choice. We know what its dimension is and we have some guesses, but it, it hasn't been figured out yet exactly what the quantum interpretation of this is. We just give the Boltzmann weights and then the Yang-Baxter equation that we write down on the vertical edges uh, in, indeed shows that it's, uh, the, the sorry, on the horizontal edges shows the horizontal is the standard module, but the vertical is, remains a little bit mysterious to us. So we use this uh, to represent Um, these Iwahori Whitaker functions. And for what I want to say today, I, I'm not going to unpack what that phrase is. If you've been around this seminar, you've been exposed to Whitaker functions enough, but this is some particular special function that can be viewed as some specialization of a non symmetric McDonald polynomial. But um, I, I, I won't go into detail, you know, why we care about this function or, or where it's coming from. Um, the only thing I'll say is that that this this first picture uh, down here is supposed to be associated to this Iwahori model, and one thing that's sort of nice about this one is that um, we're in this super algebra. So in this super algebra, we have this natural division according to the grading of R basis vectors in one piece of the grading and one basis vector in the other, and that gives us a kind of distinguished element to not color and then R things to color. In this super algebra R slash one, I have a distinguished element to not color and then R things to color. So it makes sense to treat them differently. But what's what's a little surprising to me if we go back to the the um, the Bordine Wheeler is there we were doing SLR plus one. There's no unique distinguished thing to uncolor. So it's a it's a little interesting. I don't know I, I'd be happy to hear um, uh, thoughts about this, if, if you have them, about sort of, um, you know, what makes a particular uh, uncolor distinguished for SLR plus one. Here, there's a natural choice in the super algebra. And, and we, we pay this off even further in a later generalization. So later, we, we generalize this to something even more ghastly that I will explain even less about, metaplectic iwahori whitaker functions. Again, some special functions coming from the representation theory of, of, of groups over local fields. And here we're using uh, modules from U, Q, S, L, R, N hat, where R is the rank of the group and N is this um, finite degree cover that we impose in the definition of the metaplectic group. So here we see a very different use of color before it was parametrizing the rank of the associated group. And now color is parametrizing uh, this very different object, this very different algebraic thing, this degree of the cover of the metaplectic group. It's color me confused. And so the, the model associated to that um, is, is down here at the bottom of the page. It's the example that adorns our solvable lattice model seminars website. Um, and, and here you see that, that again, um, you know, I've got one set of colors 
uh, going down and to the right and another set of colors, we call them super colors or scullers uh, going down and to the left. And, and so it's exactly the right analog of this uncolored case where we had a, a distinguished uncolor and then a bunch of colors. Here we see this fully packed model where we have a distinguished bunch of colors and a distinguished bunch of super colors and, and sort of every horizontal edge is occupied by a color or a super color. Okay. Um, yeah, this, there, there, there's a number of comments I could make about this. I'll just content myself with uh, one or two. Um, one is that it's, it's actually hard to distinguish uh, between uh, the R matrices of uh, U, Q, uh, S, L, R1 hat and U, Q, uh, S, L, R plus one hat. Uh, the, the difference between these two R matrices is just in, in one very small piece. And it can be very easy to sort of look at those and, and see something different. In fact, if the, if the boundary conditions are simple, if, if the boundary conditions are simple, so if they never use uh, repeated colors, then you can't really distinguish between the two. I could say much more about that. We have remarks in our paper about that. And in the end, what, what turned out is that we, we needed to use more complicated boundary conditions in order to see whether or not we were actually doing the super algebra R matrix or the algebra R matrix. And, and that led us to actually connect some of these more complicated boundary conditions to interesting matrix coefficients, these parahoric Whitaker functions. So that was both a, a, a that was kind of a cool aside. Um, that, that we obtained that result questing for whether or not we were an algebra or a super algebra. The other thing I'll say is that um, I mentioned before that we can modify these weights by Drinfeld twisting. And it um, requires um, certain relations among the weights. And one thing I find interesting is that those relations are uh, mirrored by the relations uh, satisfied uh, by Gauss sums. So these Gauss sums don't have very many multiplicative identities on them, uh, but one of the sort of more famous multiplicative identities is if you've got um, G, uh, so the, these Gauss sums have characters and powers of, of multiplicative characters indexed by powers mod N. And if I take uh, G of A and G of minus A, so two uh, conjugate characters, then I get some, some simple uh, power of Q out of them. And that, that identity among Gauss sums is somehow exactly expressed uh, in, so this is sort of mirroring some, uh, you know, identity required of our Drinfeld twists. I guess what I'm trying to say is it seems a little bit to me like Gauss sums might be a, an almost universal object for expressing Drinfeld twisting. Okay. Um, so those are the use of colors that I wanted to stress from the past. And now I wanna pivot and talk about a use of color that um, comes up in, in my latest paper with um, my student collaborators, many of whom are here. Any, any questions about 
things so far? Uh, ben, I was just wondering about the Drinfeld twist. So I know you twist by diagonal matrices, at least all the ones I've seen. Is that Gauss sum relation? Is it just for those diagonal matrices, or is it something about like that the paper by Reshetikin or something that's like is it a, a fact about if you're Grinfeld twisting you have to have it, or is it just in the cases that you've done? Yeah. Um, I mean, you could tell that I was being a little bit imprecise, and I don't have an exactly precise statement to share about it, Andy, but it just it seems to me that um, there were certain restrictions on what one can twist by and a, and a necessary condition to be able to twist by a certain matrix in order to obtain uh, a certain set of weights uh, was that they, they satisfied some property analogous to these Gauss sums. Okay. So it was it, like, like this, the fact that Gauss sums satisfy this was a necessary condition in order to be able to introduce them as part of the Drinfeld twist. And, and the question is like, what other families of numbers have some similar kind of multiplicative property that would then allow them to be used in a Drinfeld twist? Other, other questions? Okay, so I, I, I wanna change gears uh, and talk about this um, paper that we're calling Frozen Pipes. Um, this is with uh, Claire Frechette, Andy Hart, Emily Tibor, and Kath Katie Weber. Uh, the, the initial version of this paper, as you can tell from the date, was, was posted in the summer of, of 2020, but we've been working hard to post a new version that, that we just did last month. So, so I'm going to walk you through what the results of the paper are, but also um, you know, what, what comes about in the new version. Um, what, one thing I learned from Dan uh, when I was his postdoc is that you should you should name file names by funny things because if you if you do that you'll remember where they are on your computer, and uh, and so you know frozen pipes is is a good such thing. It's it's not just um, evocative of what it's like in Minnesota where we all are uh, during January, but it um, it also speaks to the fact that there's uh, ice and pipe dreams uh, in, in the background here. Um, and, and happily, if you, if you search for frozen pipes on the archive, you get exactly one hit. So uh, you don't have to remember this number. Uh, Dan, your, your strategy is paying off for me finally. This uh, frozen pipes leads you right there. Okay. All right, so uh, the idea is that we introduce these kind of generalized Grotendieck polynomials in the paper. And I'm gonna say exactly what those Grotendieck polynomials are, but but they generalize the ones you know and love from the polynomial realizations of, of K-theory of the flag variety. And the, the key result in the paper is similar to ones that we've talked about in the past in this seminar. We show how to obtain these generalized functions uh, from a solvable lattice model. And then all the new identities that result from that, uh, in this case, like Cauchy rule, Cauchy identities and branching rules. This, this is a familiar tale. Uh, many of the papers that um, many of us have been writing, whether it's on the representation theory side or the probability side, come exactly this way. Give me a new solvable lattice model uh, and, and then use the, the graphical calculus to prove Cauchy and branching rules. And the funny thing about this paper is that we we actually started our initial versions without the Q deformation. And because we didn't have the Q deformation, we were just finding Boltzmann weights in order to give Grotendieck polynomials. We were lacking a quantum group interpretation. Well, I mean, you know, of course, when Q equals zero, we could see that like some things looked like they were limiting to our, our answer, but we, we wanted a quantum group uh, interpretation. Um, so, Maybe I'll skip to the last bullet point because it seems like the one that should be next to me right now. Um, you know, adding the Q deformation, in fact, turns out to return us to a familiar place, which is back to these evaluation modules for UQ SLR plus one hat, uh, but with a different Drenfeld twist and with a very different outcome. So um, sort of interesting to me because if you remember the Bordine and Wheeler case, 
those colored models gave Paul Littlewood polynomials and non-symmetric analogs of generalized Paul Littlewood polynomials. And when I think of the tree of symmetric functions, I think of Hall Littlewood polynomials and Grotendieck polynomials as living on very different parts of the tree. Do you think of them as living on different parts of the tree? I do, uh, because it, it's, first of all, there's like, you know, I, of course we all think of um, McDonald polynomials as the star at the top of the tree, but, in this case, like they're not simple specializations of the McDonald polynomials to Grotendieck polynomials, while there are specializations from McDonald down to Hall Littlewood and, and various other things. So um, at least the tree I am imagining uh, puts Grotendieck polynomials and Hall Littlewoods far away from each other. So it's interesting that we use the same quantum group module, but just with different affects uh, to give a different result. The other thing I'll say that was true even about the original version is that many times when you look about papers on Grotendieck polynomials, you'll see that they're restricted to these Grassmann uh, permutations. So, you know, concretely, it just means these permutations have at most one descent. Uh, so remember, you're supposed to just take your one line notation for your permutation and then um, analyze there. Uh, how, I think I made one with just one descent, looks good. Uh, so this permutation has just one descent in my one line. Uh, notation. And, and one of our motivations was to sort of understand whether or not models could exist for, for arbitrary many descents. Um, I, I say this while knowing that, you know, what's this all may have been inside of Zin Justin's head uh, all along, but we just, we didn't know it. So uh, we, we were um, questing for, for uh, an expression for Grotendieck polynomials that would handle arbitrary descents. Yeah. And then last but not least, there, there's a different model um, that happened at the same time that we were uh, originally publishing this paper that uh, involved bumpless pipe dreams. Now, if you know me, uh, I, I would completely shun that adjective bumpless, uh, but that was uh, uh, Travis and uh, Valentin uh, wrote this paper on um, a, a different model for Grotendieck polynomials, which is um, more in line with these bumpless, so-called bumpless pipe dreams. There are many advantages of the bumpless pipe dream model, but one of the advantages of our model is that it allows these beta equals zero and minus one specializations. So both the Schur and the Schubert uh, specializations are, are allowable uh, in our model. So that's kind of the top level description of the model. Let me, let me walk you through a couple of the details. Okay, so... Um, at the top of the slide here, I've written this um, rather long formula for a divided difference operator. So you can, you can see this kind of divided difference operator expression, and it's got all these extra parameters in it, beta and Q, which make it look much different than the usual Newton divided difference operator, but various specializations I think you can believe would realize uh, various um, versions of the sort of usual divided difference operator. It doesn't really matter what it is, just that a divided difference operator kind of thing exists uh, for this definition. Okay, and then you do what you usually do in order to define these polynomials by a recursion on length. You, you define a seed here, right, in the case where uh, W is equal to W naught, uh, the way we set things up. And <clears throat> then uh, you just use the recursion on the length via these uh, divided difference operators in order to generate uh, all the other polynomials in the family. Okay, so when when Q equals zero, the polynomials we're getting are just modeling the, the ring structure of the K-theory of the flag variety, you know, indexed by the Schubert classes. So multiplication of these Grotendieck polynomials is mimicking the cup product on these corresponding Schubert classes. And the, the fancy list of adjectives, I think, is uh, T equivariant connective K theory. So K theory gives me my initial X parameters. The beta comes from this connective K theory, and I can give you some references on that if you're interested. And then the, the T equivariance imposes that second set of variables Y. So I put it all together and I've got this, at least at Q equals zero, I know the geometric meaning of this. It's this T equivariant connective K theories. Um, it's the polynomials that model the Schubert classes in T equivariant connective K theory. 
But we can go even further, you know, just sort of led by the lattice models. Um, there, there are these kind of doubly, oop, these uh, doubly indexed uh, elements. So they have these two partitions V and W, and so we call them biaxial models. Um, and they similarly are produced by some demoser like operators acting on the singly indexed partitions. Okay. So there's some very complicated or very general looking divided difference operators that, that generalize the usual ones for Groton D polynomials. And, and the point is that they come from these weights at the bottom of the slide. And since you've all memorized the Borodine Wheeler weights that I started with, you can look at these and instantly see that they're the same uh, up to a bunch of changes of variables and Drinfeld twists. Um, so the, the one thing that's sort of strange about this one is that um, you'll see this kind of uh, slash O plus in LaTeX uh, that's supposed to mean a, a formal group law. And so here, this, this formal group law means you know some group law that's like the multiplicative law, but deformed by beta. So it's x plus y plus beta xy is this multiplicative sort of beta formal group law. That's what's um, being used here. I, I mentioned this in a prior talk in the solvable lattice sem model seminar, but that's an interesting further way to generalize some of these weighting schemes is that you can input different formal group laws and then get out different uh, geometry. There's, there's really nice work by Korf and Gorbunov, which sort of explain that in the context of the five vertex model mostly, but here we're doing it in a six vertex model context and it's still working. Okay, so the definition doesn't so much matter. I just wanted to highlight a few features of it, but are there questions that I can explain about the particulars of this definition? Okay, great. So um, as I said before, the kinds of applications we have in these cases are um, you know, generalized Cauchy identities. So for example, when, when Q is equal to zero, one of the main uh, corollaries of our theorem that a solvable lattice model uh, gives these Grotendieck polynomials is this Cauchy identity where you see um, we've got this sum of products of Grotendieck uh, polynomials on one side, and it's matching some other generalized Grotendieck polynomial on the other. But if we set um, W equals W0, then you'll remember that this uh, GW0 was this product of stuff, and that reminds you of the usual Cauchy identity uh, for um, Grotendieck polynomials or sure functions. Okay, so this, this is generalizing the usual uh, uh, Cauchy identity. And uh, I, I use this minus C for this inversion law in the formal group, which uh, explicitly is just this, this change of uh, coordinates here. So it's kind of interesting that that shows up naturally in the, the Cauchy identity. And just, just to give you some idea of how we, we prove this kind of thing, um, we have some, some model where we stack weights with respect to the weights I showed you earlier, and then another set of weights, which uh, we sort of had to mess around with in order to derive appropriately. And then the key is that you don't just have Yang-Baxter equations, which would interchange two sets of S star weights or interchange two sets of S weights, but rather you have these mixed Yang-Baxter equations that can exchange things from one set of weights to, to things with another set of weights. So it's something from a one, you know, you're, you're imagining each of these is connected to different modules of a quantum group, and you can still come up with uh, an R matrix that um, solves the Yang-Baxter equation for, for that sort of mixed set where the modules come from different sources. So that's what we do to, for example, just to prove the base case, that's what this graphic is showing. We, we repeatedly use the Yang-Baxter equation to sort of arrange things so that, you know, these rows are kind of on top of each other and then show that there aren't many configurations in the resulting rows and evaluate the thing as a result. 
then you're off to the races. You show that both of them satisfy the same recursion relations and, and, and off you go. But I, I think the interesting thing here is that we're combining these modules in an interesting way and we're using those mixed Yang-Baxter equations in order to conclude the Cauchy identity. And even the way I'm telling it to you is a tiny bit too pat because I knew the quantum interpretation of S and I knew the quantum interpretation of S star, but we don't actually know that S and S star are like simultaneous modules for the same quantum group. So we don't just uh, say, ta-da, we know that there's a Yang-Baxter equation. We actually check the Yang-Baxter equation brutally uh, in this case. So it's, it's not perfect. Um, we're not using only quantum group module theory to conclude the Yang-Baxter equation. There's some, some, some actual uh, elbow grease. Uh, required. And just, just for fun, I put the most general like biaxial model uh, that I could think of, that we could think of uh, indexed by these pairs of partitions. And, and then it's like really beautifully symmetric uh, at the end. Okay, so the takeaway here is that by coming up with a lattice model with different geometry, that is this kind of stacked model where we, remember how we do this Cauchy identity, we can on the one hand cut that model in half and evaluate the two pieces to get the right-hand side of the equality. And then on the other side, we get the, we, we evaluate it in a different way using the Yang-Baxter equation to get the left side of the Cauchy identity. And that's that, that geometric proof that is exciting to me for these identities. Okay, so let me tell you what the original motivation was. Um, the original motivation was that we were gonna come up with these generalized Littlewood-Richardson coefficients for Grotendieck polynomials. This is a famous unsolved problem in combinatorics for just um, good old regular Grotendieck uh, polynomials to, to understand what the structure constants are. But maybe in order to explain it, I'll just take you way back to the original Littlewood-Richardson rule. So remember in the, the Littlewood, the ordinary Littlewood-Richardson rule for sure polynomials, I'm taking my, my two polynomials and I'm re-expressing it in a new basis of sure polynomials like so. And again, these are my, my LR coefficients. And, and just as I can do this for ordinary cohomology of the flag variety, variety I can do it for K-theory or souped up versions of K-theory. And the question is, what does this have to do with solvable lattice models? Uh, and so um, Knudsen and Tao, they, they proposed this language of puzzle combinatorics uh, to compute these Littlewood-Richardson coefficients. Uh, and so basically what they do is that they have these puzzle pieces Since I spent so much time on the tech portion in the beginning, uh, I'll just roughly tell you. So there are equilateral triangle pieces that are made with all zeros and all ones on the edges. I'll explain these edge labels in a second. And then there are rhombuses. So there are four triangles and there are three uh, different kinds of, how, what's the plural of rhombus? Rhombi. Okay, so then there are these three different kinds of rhombi uh, with uh, alternating uh, zeros and ones as you go clockwise around the, the rhombus. It doesn't really matter which four they are, which three the, the rhombuses they are, but the point is that the way to calculate the Littlewood Richardson coefficients is you make this um, equilateral triangle. And along the sides of this equilateral triangle, you write these binary strings. And these binary strings are encoding your partitions. So like maybe across this way, you have mu and across this way, you have nu and across this way, you have lambda, it doesn't really matter. But the point is that the partitions are being encoded along the boundary by this binary string. And then you try to fill in this with puzzle pieces made out of um, triangles and rhombi in various ways. And the number of ways that you can fill it out so that all the edges match is the Littlewood-Richardson coefficient. 
Have people, everybody seen this already? I haven't told you anything uh, new before. So, so the number of fillings uh, is equal to And you know, there's a there's a whole cottage industry of puzzle combinatorics now, where you can add puzzle pieces in order to give the structure constants for other interesting bases. And so you add different geometric shapes to your catalog of puzzle pieces, and you try again to um, fill in this equilateral triangle with the new puzzle pieces. And it's um, charming that you can just seemingly always add as you go more general uh, and get these these uh, same kinds of counting properties. So that's that's notes and tau. Uh, and and what uh, Zin Justin explained in uh, this archive paper from two thousand and eight uh, is that um, there, this there's a solvable lattice model. Uh, behind this puzzle combinatorics. And, and so then he was able to give a, a YBE proof uh, of uh, the Littlewood-Richardson rule. So I, I wanna just show you in pictures what that Yang-Baxter equation proof of the, the Littlewood-Richardson rule uh, looks like. Because that's sort of that was our motivation in in this project was if if it can be done for sure functions maybe it can be done for Grotendieck polynomials if one can make a creative enough use of the lattice models I just showed you which give Grotendieck polynomials for arbitrary descents. Okay, so the idea is basically that um, we were seeing in our lattice model uh, these kind of uh, vertices, and maybe there would be a colored path in that vertex. But but then Justin would replace that vertex with a tile. Okay, and in that tile, instead of having a path like this, he would he would maybe straighten that line out to a red line like this. Are you sort of following me with how this could come about that that we have this tile like this? And then in order to distinguish between various tiles, he would skew them. So one set of Boltzmann weights would be parallelograms skewed one way. And another set of Boltzmann weights would be parallelograms skewed another way. And the last set of Boltzmann weights would be these uh, rhombi in, in this orientation. Okay, so these are three different sets of Boltzmann weights. And the way I can distinguish them is because I've taken my tile and I've skewed it in different ways. Does this make sense? And then the statement of the Yang-Baxter equation is just that there are two different ways of um, orienting this tile. So the Yang-Baxter equation just becomes this simple identity, that this rendering of a 3D box is the same as that rendering of a 3D box. Sorry, Ben, can you push yeah. your, your uh, just a little bit? It's at the bottom of the page for me. I can't see. So no, up or better? Yeah, there. <laughs> Great, thanks. Yeah, it won't, it, because I'm side flipping a rune, it won't let me go up any higher so I can just zoom. Uh, yeah, okay. So. I, I find this a charming way to view the Yang-Baxter equation, this sort of uh, pushing the vertex of a box into the background and, and kind of inverting the box in a different direction. If you've ever looked at a paper of Zin Justin's, you know that he's a master of graphical arts, uh, a, a really an artist and, and just the perfect person to steal from when you're trying to like wrap up the talk with kind of a boom. So let me just show you uh, his pictures uh, of the, um, the Littlewood Richardson proof. Um, so, so let me just kind of walk you through what we're star staring at here. So you see this, this box over here on the left. And what he's trying to tell you is that this rectangle, which is labeled E, is giving you 
the sure function attached to mu. You don't know that, but trust me that the, if I summed over all configurations with this boundary condition, I would get the sure function attached to mu on the left-hand side. He's shown one picture here, but you could, the point is that the, along here, he's encoding the partition for mu. And that boundary, when you sum over all admissible configurations gives S mu, okay? And then similarly down here, right? The, these two red dots in this position are giving this relatively simple partition of one, one. And so here, if we sum over these boundary conditions, we'll get S lambda. So that's what A is. A is corresponding to S lambda and that's this box, okay? There are other boxes here, three other boxes, and I've put a check mark in them to obviously indicate that they are boring. They give nothing. Like they, they're, they're all sort of standard configurations. You can see them from most of the check marks. Like this one down here is as boring as it could possibly be, right? It's just a couple of straight lines. And so it contributes nothing. And here, you know, maybe you could guess that because these guys are like crowded down around the bottom that it's kind of boring. It turns out you have to do some work to prove it's boring, but it's boring. Um, in fact, in a nod to um, frozen pipes, he calls such a state frozen, there's only one admissible configuration in this diamond. And so that's, that's why it's boring, it's frozen. And, and now let's go over to the other box. So this, this is the box that's sort of after the Yang-Baxter equation. And then F is the only kind of uh, interesting one other than this diamond. So I've got this diamond here that's left over. And then I've got boring, boring, boring. And you can really see how boring the uh, other pieces are because they're all just straight line pieces. So you'll believe me that their weights are boring. But here I've got this diamond. And the whole point, of course, is that the, the, this, these diamonds are puzzles. And the bottom picture explains why the diamonds are puzzles that um, we can slice it in half, and it's not obvious from this picture, but what I do is I, I rotate this bottom guy up to the top, and this piece, um, you can't tell, but it turns out it's, it's sort of boring, and so uh, that's why he gets the Little Wood Richardson rule. So I, I find that proof rather staggering. Um, because it's, it's this beautiful graphical explanation of two lattice models living on a box and their relation by the Yang-Baxter equation that gives the Littlewood-Richardson rule for sure polynomials. Okay, we have three minutes left together. So uh, I think what can you, we- since you, since you started 10 minutes later, I think you can take a bit of time and finish. Well, okay, we'll see. But I feel kind of guilty about that. So maybe I'll, I'll, um, I'll take four minutes instead of three. Uh, okay, so the, I just want to tell you what you can say about Grote and Deke polynomials at the end, okay? So, so what can we, what about uh, Grote and Deke polynomials? So here, actually, uh, this same thought occurred uh, to Knudsen and Zin Justin. Uh, and they have this two part series, which I wrote down, I wrote down the title of somewhere, but I, I don't know where that piece of paper I'll get you the title uh, later on and I'll add it to these notes, but um, it's, it's something, I, I don't know, it's, it's disappeared, but they have these this two, thanks Andy, Schubert puzzles and integrability one and two. And um, it's very interesting because they see the ability uh, to draw these box diagrams with uh, Yang-Baxter equation as related to uh, embeddings 
of subgroups in quantum groups, which they can basically boil down to uh, Dinkin diagrams. And the reason is vaguely like this, that you want two different sets of models to be able to live inside some bigger system where you anticipate a Yang-Baxter equation. So you have the first model, and maybe that model comes from you know, GL3. And then you have a second model, and that model also comes from GL3. And why should they have a Yang-Baxter equation between them if they're like different separate entities? It's because these two GL3s live inside some bigger group uh, in which there's like some larger Yang-Baxter equation that allows you to make the colors sort of merge and overlap in these mixed Yang-Baxter equations. So, so they see this ability to, to draw box diagrams as limited by the embeddings of subgroups in quantum groups. And that's why they can do descents that are one, two, three, or four corresponding to the groups uh, with you know, root systems Uh, I'm actually forgetting what the, is it A2, D4, E6, E8? Is that the right list? Um, so yeah, and, and obviously um, something bad happens when you try to do five descents, um, you, you run out of groups. It's, it's a little bit reminiscent of a problem that automorphic forms people know very well where um, people were trying to do symmetric powers of L functions by embedding Levy subgroups in larger, um, uh, Lie, Lie groups and Lie algebras. And, and we were limited to be able to do the symmetric fourth power because of certain Levy subgroups that could be realized inside of E8. Um, so it's, it's kind of an interesting uh, parallel there. It isn't to say that we couldn't come up with some smarter graphical realization of these models uh, that isn't the box diagram in order to prove the Littlewood Richardson rule. So I think that's my uh, the thing I'll leave you with is, um, you know, can we, you know, can we come up with an alternate model, with an alternate model, you know, not the box, um, such that Yang-Baxter equations uh, would give these generalized Littlewood Richardson rules. Okay, thanks very much for your attention. I hope you're less confused about color. I'd be happy to take questions. Let's thank the speaker, thank you.